Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dread Time Stories. I'm your host, Dr. Phobia. And tonight, our story comes from the world of creepypastas. More specifically, Disney-themed creepypastas. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sequel to last night's tale, Room Zero. It's been a while since I've posted anything related to the Disney Corporation, and I'm sure you can understand why. A lot has been going on since my last post. I've received a lot of questions and concern from folks who read my first-hand account of Mowgli's Palace, a resort that was built and abandoned by Disney. I want to thank everyone who mirrored my post. It's been taken down from a few places, mostly corporate sites that are easily leaned on from a higher power. However, for every nuked post or disappearing topic, it seems like a hundred more have popped up. This is something they'll have to face. There's no turning back for them, none for me either. I'm definitely being followed. For the first month or two, I chalked it up to paranoia. Any casual glance or half smile in my direction set me off, hair standing on the back of my neck and everything. The first one, or rather, the first one I actually was able to spot was a telephone worker milling around my apartment complex. He was middle-aged, doughy, dressed just as you'd expect, but something seemed off about him. I couldn't place it, but I knew it wasn't just my imagination acting up. He was awkward and out of place, not somebody who was comfortable doing his routine job. I followed him around a corner, only to lose him there. When I turned back to go home, there he was, staring directly at me, about ten feet behind me, expressionless and cold. Exploring? he asked. That was all he said and there was an accusing tone in his voice. Tell me, what blue-collar phone jockey does that? I guess that's the worst part. Never feeling safe. Never feeling alone. That and the occasional Disney merchandise left somewhere for me to find. Little rubber mickeys in the mailbox. A Disney Adventures magazine on my bookshelf. <laughs> they hide little mickeys everywhere. Three circles, one big, two small, in the silhouette of the famous mouse's head. I've started running in a list of all the Mickeys I've found. Coffee cups on my table, one big, two small. Colored glass bottles left on the doorstep, viewed from the top down, all red. Graffiti on the wall on my way to work. A huge earth, a small sun and moon in the proper locations. They're everywhere. People have emailed me about this as well. If you repost anything I have to say, you're going to start finding those outlines too. I guarantee it. The best one by far, one that actually made me laugh because of the horror of it all, was a chalk drawing next to my car. I was taken aback at first, walking through the parking garage, keeping my eye out for people following me. The outline seemed to be a perfect match for, well... A murder victim. You're probably familiar with it if you read my last post. Written in yellow paint, I'm sure, was a single word. Retract. The only good thing that has come out of all of this is that I know I'm not the only one who's seen something they shouldn't have. And I'm not going to give out their names because, well, if I have to tell you why, then you haven't been paying attention. Researcher goes to the Disney parks whenever he can all throughout the year. He's not there to have fun, enjoy the rides, etc. He's looking for the gas cots. There's been a long tradition, apparently, of people reporting strange patrons throughout the park. Silent, motionless, starring patrons of every age, shape, and size. Men, women, adults, children, and teens all wearing Disney-themed gas mask. Way back when, Disney would get tons of complaints about oddly dressed folks following others around the park. Folks who would then merge into crowds and disappeared. 
Later on, the gas mask caused folks to draw other conclusions. Reports of possible terrorists and bombers started flowing. All of these reports were most likely taken straight to the trash can. I know I can't find a single sign of any such occasion reported on the media. Although you should be aware of the fact that Disney can pretty much control its press like no other. Researcher goes to the parks, talks to a few people, and tries not to draw any attention to himself. He'll just ask three or four families if they've seen his friend who's wearing a funny mask. He has not seen a gascot for himself yet, though on one occasion, a child pointed him towards Frontier Town. As he raced through the crowd, he overheard a single voice ahead cry out, Mommy, I want a goofy air mask too. A fellow I'll call Lifeguard worked in a Disney water park from 01 to 03. He stood at the top of a huge water slide and made sure none of the kids got too rowdy. As he passed the kids through one at a time, telling them over and over again to be safe, keep arms in, and so on. One day, as he tells it, this fat kid goes down the tube and doesn't come out the other end. He sent two or three kids after. The whole thing moves at a steady clip, so naturally you'd expect, if Fatty got stuck, the kids behind him were stuck too. Not so. Only the big kid disappeared. Everyone else comes out the other end, cheering and splashing like nothing's wrong. Lifeguard shuts down the slide, to much of the aggravation of the kids waiting. Before he can go through any of Disney's strict procedures, splash, Fatty finally comes out. Staff members pull the kid out of the water. He sank like a stone when he hit, his skin already blue when his eyes wide. All he would say was, no-faced kids and stop squeezing. The kid was okay, in case you're wondering. He got carted off right away to the medical center. When lifeguard was told to open the slide back up, he made a big stink about how it clearly wasn't safe. Despite his complaints, he was threatened with firing and begrudgingly opened the slide again. From that point on, he kept a close eye on the kids, and every so often, they'd come out in the wrong order. Never as stunned as the fat kid, but always with a vague look of concern. A dreamy half-stupor that seemed as if they were trying to figure out what was reality. They'd take on some water and choke a bit, but they'd never come back up to ride again. I read his emails with the same sort of unease you might be feeling right now. I wanted him to share his story, but in the end, he didn't want to expose himself in that way. I can't say I blame him. Snow White, which actually wasn't the role she played, was a character in the park. She had a nice little tidbit for me. Do you know what happens when a costume employee drops dead in his suit? Like one second he's taking a picture with little Jimmy, and the next he's had a fatal stroke. <laughs> a second costume mascot in the area has to sit with the corpse on a curb or bench to wait for the designated dry cleaner to arrive and cart the body away in a discreet manner. All the while, patrons have no idea they're sitting with a dead body for photo ops. Feel free to check your albums at this point. That was bad, but another fellow, Janitor, went completely off the creepy charts. Disney World, and probably other as, as well, is built on a series of underground tunnels just below your feet. Three stories worth. Anything and everything you can imagine is down there for use of the employees. They're called Utilidors. Utility corridors. Basically, that's the reason you don't see characters out of place or janitors wandering through the park. They pop in and out of hidden doors and travel discreet or concealed town that you're walking on. Janitor told me something that might be common knowledge, but nonetheless was news to me. Walt Disney had several apartments built into his parks. There's one above Cinderella's castle, and there's one in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. They're all over the place. More than that, there are nightclubs, a movie theater, a bowling alley, and much more. 
all behind doors built right into the whimsical facades you passed without a second look. Club 22 is one such area. If you have the cash to join the exclusive club, you don't, then you'll have access to it and much more. Club 22 is a place where anything goes. Disney Company calls these places dark zones. Spot where the squeaky clean visage of Mickey Mouse gives away to drinking, drugs, and yes, sex. Controversy, the rest of the park is called the Bright Zone, with a few Gray Zone utilidors in between. As far as janitor has said, it wasn't always that way. It was more of a slow decline and the gradual relaxation of social norms within that elite group. The reason he knows all of this? You may have guessed. He's cleaned it. After a lengthy background check and a non-disclosure form, Janitor moved up from park attendant to one of the Dark Zone cleaning crew. Now before you get some satanic human sacrifice vision in your head, Janitor saw nothing of the sort. Lots of empty alcohol bottles? Yes. Use condoms scattered like deflated New Year's balloons? Oh yeah. He's cleaned up his fair share of blood, piss, and vomit too. But it was all down in the unrestricted behavior of patrons as opposed to any sort of cult behavior. At least that's how he sees it now in retrospect. All that trash... That profane crap went into a furnace and mingled with the smoke of a quaint cottage's chimney. If you've been to Walt Disney World, you've bathed in ultra-condensed sin. Backing up this information was Hammer. Hammer mailed me the old-fashioned way, though I don't know how he got my home address. He sent me photocopies of his work papers, proving his employment with instructions to burn them when I was convinced. Which I did gladly. Hammer worked around the Disney World Park doing demolition and construction. At one point, he approached a superior regarding some strange construction plans. There was a wide rectangular area marked off on the blueprints, about the size of a supermarket. It was left unnamed and only bore the words, Do not dig. Not only was his superior in the dark, but he was super freaking personally in the dark. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to know about it and ended the conversation with this space intentionally left blank. Hammer didn't get it. This area was a waste of space and it directly conflicted with the work him and his team had been given. He started poking around the area in his time off, only finding a derelict steel door with a great span of concrete just beyond. A supermarket worth of blank gray flooring. Soon after, Hammer started picking gascots out of the crowd. Unlike other reports, the people, the things, would stand in full view of the guy. They'd cluster together in the distance, or they'd be pressed against a wall when he turned the corner. He said they moved weird, like they were weak or injured, like a deer that has been run down by a hunter and can't flee anymore. The gas mask, the Disney characters' faces with filters jammed in, he noted seemed to be wet on the inside, like condensation on a car window. Tiny beads of water glimmered behind the glass, making it impossible for any of them to actually see. Probing further, Hammer started asking questions of anyone and everyone who had been working in the park for a decade or more. He hit dead ends, though, until he was directed to Ida, an elderly woman who worked in a restaurant on Main Street. She had been there since way back, and though nobody had the balls to ask directly, everyone knew she had plenty of terrible secrets to tell. Hammer asked about the empty space, then about the gas mask customers. At first, he thought he would receive the same non-answers he'd gotten so far. She was quiet. Eerily quiet. Room zero, she croaked. A single shaking hand placed to her cheek as if she were a little girl feeling, fearing her father's punishment. 
She didn't even meet the man's gaze for the entire conversation. Room Zero, as it turned out, was yet another hidden room just like the apartments in Club 22. However, its sheer size and spot beneath the park set it apart from any of the fun dark zones. It was a bomb shelter. Room Zero was built to withstand a massive attack, be it conducted by foreign or domestic enemies. Room Zero was to be stocked with enough ration to feed the entire park's average number of patents at any given moment, and housed several smaller, let lavish, panic rooms of sorts for Disney higher-ups. During WW2, official Disney gas masks were given to children to wear in the event of attack. The idea is that it would be less scary for kids if Mickey's face was put on the wartime safety device. Yes, I know the obvious problems with that. During the Cold War scare of the 60s when Disney was constructed, Room Zero was stocked with similar masks as well. Whether they cared about the fears of children or just callous branding, the things found their way down there. What's more, some genius decided that kids would then be frightened of the gas mask their parents wore, so all masks, adult and child, were made to comply to this insane standard. Ida described it as treating a wound with lemon juice. None of this explained what Hammer had been seeing, though. Not only the seemingly supernatural appearances, but the emptied out room as well. I've been in there, he explained. There's nothing but cement four and four walls. No. Ida shook her head as she covered her mouth, stifling a sob. You've been on top of it. Someone or something sounded the alarm one day when the park was at full capacity. The warning was clear. It was supposedly an air attack. Security ushered everyone down, down, down into the tremendous shelter. There, they were ordered to put on their mask and hunker down for the duration of the assault. Everything was quiet for about 30 minutes, save for the crying of children and frightened whispers. No one wanted to die, so they were very thankful in a way for the strange measure of safety. That's when the first scream rang out. Hey, a man shouted, quit pinching. Waves of shrieks and yelps rippled through the crowd from one wall to the other, back and forth. Who's running around? Settle down, someone hollered. Who's laughing? This isn't funny. Ow, who stepped on my foot? Despite the security guards urging everyone to calm down and keep their cool, the crowd became more and more agitated until finally, nearly an hour of madness, the lights flickered, then died. What followed next could only be described as utter chaos. In the dark, only the wails of the young and the anguished cries of adults could be heard in a massive, swelling din that bloodied the ears of all within that black echo chamber. A group of staff members and a select few patrons made it out of the door, ready to face the war above rather than the insanity below. What they found, of course, was a desolate yet untouched theme park. The music continued to play, echoing through the silent storybook towns. Upon returning to Room Zero, the few who stood at the top of the steel staircase, which led down to the pitch-black darkness, heard no sound of the previous fray. There was only silence. Ida herself descended the staircase despite the begging of those she left above. When she reached the reinforced doors, herself now awash in the darkness, only hearing the buzz in her ears, a single voice came out of the darkness. The echo made it impossible to tell whether the mocking, raspy voice came out of the back of the bomb shelter or if it was right in front of her face. Shut the door, dear. You are letting out the cold. Gripped by terror, she did just that. Within days, the entire thing, shelter, staircase, all of it, was covered with feet upon feet of cement. 
air systems and generators above its ceiling were removed, creating a large, empty space. They're still down there, Ida told Hammer. Down there with whoever that was. You might have noticed that I used Ida's real name. Unfortunately, she passed away soon after telling her story. Accidental fall, supposedly, after getting out of bed to turn on a light. Such a company devotee, the paper reported, that her entire bedroom was covered with Mickey silhouettes. That was Room Zero. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for listening. Like I always say in closing, check under your bed, look in your closet, and sleep with the light on. The life you save may very well be your own. Good night, everyone.